Hi, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Pakhuis is Weiger, also on behalf of Thrive Institute. Uh, tonight, we're organizing a hybrid event. We have an audience live here with us. And also, a warm welcome to you uh, listening in from your homes. Uh, my name is Sita Oswell. I'll be your host for tonight. And uh, here's my sidekick. Case. <laughs> Hello. Uh, about three weeks ago, we launched uh, our book, Thrive, Fundamentals for a New Economy. And uh, this is a, a series to celebrate the launch of our book. And we're kicking off tonight with regenerative economics. Very excited to be speaking to our guests tonight. Mm -hmm. We have quite some interesting guests, some joining us online and some here at our table. We'll uh, zoom in on our guests a little later on. But first, we wrote a book. Uh, uh, yeah, we, yes, we, we did. We wanted to change the economy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we gave a, a few perspectives to our readers. Yeah. And one of those perspectives is regenerative economics. Why yeah. did we do that again? <laughs> well, because it's so positive. Maybe that's, uh, it, it's, it's, it, it gives me hope, yeah. uh, regenerative, because it's so accessible, it's understandable. Yeah. And uh, and it works. It's yeah. proven. It's a proof of concept. We were looking for for um, moving beyond sustainability, right? Yes. Instead of reducing the negative impact, we wanted to promote a positive impact. Yeah, nature positive. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And it's out there. It is. Yeah. And one of the people to go to to ask about regenerati regenerative economics is John Fullerton. Of course. Yes. <laughs> the one and only. <laughs> and we're very happy to, to welcome John Fullerton with us tonight. Um, John, are you there? Yeah. We can't hear you just now. There we go. Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Hi, John. Hey, John. Thanks for being with us again. You were well. also here for our book launch. We're very happy that you're here again. My, um, my pleasure. I'm going to need an apartment in, uh, yeah. in Amsterdam. An online in, apartment. In, in Holland soon. Well, you're very welcome. Uh, let me introduce you just for the people who don't know you yet. Um, John, you started out your career on Wall Street. And when you left Wall Street, you decided to become a very unconventional economist and founded the Capital Institute. Um, you wrote a chapter in our book about regenerative economics, and I'd really like to ask you, could you tell us a little bit more about uh, what regenerative economics means to you? Sure. I mean, the, um, the, the issue that I believe is, is now um, self-evident, but wasn't when I began this journey, is that the root cause of all of these interconnected crises that are now kind of mushrooming out of control uh, from social to political to economic to financial and, 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 of course, to ecological, are actually rooted in our economic system design. And our economic system is fueled and driven and dominated by our financial system and, and the finance ideology that really drives it. And so if, if we're going to get a, get, come to grips with these interconnected crises, it requires kind of going back to square one, square zero, ground zero, and get clear on the economic system design. And, and when you study the, the history of economics, um, and we don't have time to go through this story here, but, um, um, uh, but it, it, it's actually extraordinary wh what that story is and, and where it's rooted and the errors that were made along the way that are, that are non-controversial, like things like the neoclassical theory is literally founded on Newtonian physics, um, even though the physicists at the time told the economists at the time that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So th there's some fairly obvious, in hindsight, errors, but we've never gone back and fixed those flaws. And so what I did in the paper I wrote in 2015, which is the first really the second attempt, it's the first time I published the, this idea of rethinking the entire economy around this concept of regeneration. The premise is really quite simple. Um, the first is that the human economy is a living system. Now we could debate that, 
but uh, the, the argument in favor of that is that human beings are living systems. That's not debatable. And if you buy into the emerging science in, in all the way out to cosmology, the universe is now understood as a living system. And yeah. certainly our planet is a living system, self-organizing, self-governing in a way that's magical. So the premise of regenerative economics is that if the human economy is to behave in a sustainable way, like other living systems, it'll need to mirror and be organized in such a way that it looks like other living systems. And so in order to, um, uh, in order to begin to rethink economics, you need to first get clear on the, what are the patterns and principles of all living systems. And, um, and that's essentially the, the core idea of regenerative economics um, is that, you know, if we are to be, have a sustainable system, it'll need to behave uh, the way other sustainable systems do, which is why living systems is so foundational. And, and it's not that, oh, John, he's an environmentalist, so he's looking to nature, but we, you know, if you're not an environmentalist, you can look in other directions. No, the, the point is that it's all a living system and that the foundational science for economics, therefore, is ecology, more specifically process ecology, uh, not, uh, not mathematics and physics, which is, the, um, uh, which is where our economic system, our, our neoclassical theory came from. Um, now, this is an entirely different approach to dealing with the problems of economics than what is can, uh, typically done in the mainstream and even in the mainstream sustainability conversations. You know, we have a tremendous amount of effort, uh, for example, going into rethinking metrics. Yep. And so we have ESG and we have impact metrics and we have all kinds of metrics to try to, um, uh, you know, manage what matters. But we're not fundamentally rethinking the system design. It even mean, it e it's even different than rethinking the goals of the system, as important as it is to rethink the goals of the system. So sales growth, if you're a company, or GDP growth, if you're a nation, are the accepted growth uh, or, or, or goals of the system. And those we need to rethink for sure, but uh, the regenerative paradigm is fundamentally um, uh, different than that. And it is essentially getting clear on understanding the process that gives, um, uh, that is responsible for living systems being not only sustainable, but uh, creating uh, abundance and prosperity that exists in the natural world. Yeah, would that so, be the highest aspiration of a regenerative economic? I'm sorry? Would that be the highest aspiration of regenerative economics? Absolutely, I mean, yeah. I, I, you know, I love the, the expression that, that uh, several of my colleagues, probably Laura, uh, uses this term, I can't remember, but within the regenerative space, um, the concept or the word thrive um, uh, is, is, um, uh, is, a wonderful, is a wonderful expression, which, you know, some clever people even use as a book title. So um, <laughs> I, 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 think, I think we all want to thrive. I mean, the, the truth is the regenerative process is responsible for, for miracles. Yeah. You know, the miracle of life is the result of the regenerative process. Yeah. Um, so why can't that be, you know, the design principle of our economy? Yeah. Um, and, well, and, and just to, well, sorry. Well, just, what I really, um, well, I want to say admire, but what I really want to appreciate about your contribution to our book is that you've managed to translate um, what you are telling us now about regenerative econ economics into the finance world. So right back where you started. Could you tell us a little bit more about that journey? Hmm. Well, that's an, un that's an unfinished journey, my friend. Yeah. Um, that's for sure. You're right on track, though. I, I mean, I, I, you know, that, that's a, that's, that journey is just beginning. I, I, you know, I, and I say this with no malice, but those of us who grew up in the financial world uh, have assumptions. A lot of what we believe is rooted in assumptions we haven't yet questioned. And that's no more true, that's no truer uh, anywhere that I'm familiar with than it is in finance. And so um, 
this is a long, deep conversation that we, you know, I don't know how to even summarize it here, but, but the basic idea is that there are these principles, and, and it's not that there are eight principles. That's just one man's best effort to reduce something that is complex beyond our comprehension and all interconnected and all self-organizing into a linear list that we can use to talk about it mm -hmm. um, and talk about it in the context of an, of an entire economy. But there's nothing magical about those eight descriptions. Um, but, but they're not a bad compass to use when we're trying to navigate our way out of you know, the fog. And so the way I'm approaching literally all aspects of the economy, including the financial system, is to take those eight principles and use them as a compass and see where they, um, where they create uh, alignment and where they point to obvious uh, conflict. So for example, if one of the principles is right relationship, which I think anyone who's studied living systems for even 15 minutes would, would recognize as a fundamental description of, of how living systems work, uh, aligned with our indigenous wisdom of reciprocity, symbiotic relationships. Mm -hmm. um, if that is a quality or a principle of healthy living systems, and we look to our capital markets, not intentionally, but we've actually severed the relationship between asset owners, investors, uh, and the enterprises that they invest in. Yeah. So what we have is asset owners who who allocate money to fund managers who buy and sell stocks and and some of them on very short term time horizons, some on longer term horizons, but none of them really have a relationship with the enterprise yeah. in which they're investing anymore. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and this is why the opportunity for regenerative companies is much stronger in the private company sector than it is in the public company sphere. But we have to we have to think about how to acknowledge that there's this severed relationship, much less a lack of a healthy symbiotic relationship in these big public enterprises that are the most powerful uh, institutions that humans have ever created and deal head on with that relationship issue. And, and we got ideas on, on how to do that, but we're never going to solve this issue by getting ESG metrics to measure a bunch of stuff that doesn't acknowledge that we are, you know, we're in fundamental conflict with certainly one of, if not the basic uh, quality of healthy living systems. So I guess in, in some, the, the, the compass, the principles are meant to be our, our tour guide or our, 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 our guide to deal with getting to the root cause problems. And, and I've just given you one simple example, but there, there are many others. But yeah. I know there's a bunch of entrepreneurs at the table and they'll be yeah. happy to see that one of the principles is innovative, adaptive and responsive. Yeah. And so anyone that thinks that big government bureaucracies can solve these problems would have to look and say, well, hmm, maybe we actually need to promote entrepreneurship and, uh, and, and the innovation that exists in the, private, in the free enterprise private sector as a fundamental uh, quality of healthy living systems, rather than believe that we can simply have laws passed and policies passed that will, um, uh, that will, quote, fix our problems. Uh, now, that doesn't mean I'm not in favor of new laws and new policies, but it does mean that, you know, the government, you know, broadly speaking, big governments tend to nurture big bureaucratic industries as opposed to nurturing the entrepreneur sector. And entrepreneurs know how hard it is to build a new enterprise mm -hmm. when they're sitting within this muck of big companies with subsidies and everything else uh, surrounding them. So again, use the principles only as a, as a compass to look for where to actually deal and find the root causes of our unhealthy economic system. Yeah. Thanks, John, for that elaboration. I think it's really very helpful to lay a, 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 maybe a theoretical foundation for this evening. And you're right, we have some entrepreneurs here at the table, so we'll go into depth in that, on that, uh, on entrepreneurship. Um, you'll stay with us, right? For uh, sure, I'm the whole session. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I want to hear what Laura has to say, too. Yeah, me too. Hey, Laura. So, <laughs> Hi. Hello. We're getting to that. But uh, thanks for staying, uh, John. We'll get back to you with some questions, I, I'm sure. Um, okay. Next, at our 
uh, virtual table <laughs> will be Laura Storm joining us from Copenhagen. Hi, Laura. Oh, oh you're oh, on sorry, mute. Yes. Hello. Yes. It's Hi. So Hi. With you all. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for being with us. Laura, you've been a sustainability um, expert and activist for quite some time. You have quite a, quite a resume. You're also the author of uh, Regenerative Leadership, and I believe that you're treating us on a TED Talk-like presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> or to lower expectations. What, yeah. I, what I will do and what I've been asked to do is just to give you a kind of a 10 minute introduction into Great. what does this mean? What does it mean to talk about regenerative economics in the context of leadership? And what is demanded from us in terms of, um, of leading the regenerative transition, but also what I would like to to offer you is a very concrete uh, framework that people that are in, in the audience today could already start applying this evening, if they're very eager, or tomorrow at least. Yeah. Um, because what is also needed now is to make this very tangible. So what I will do is just to talk for 10 minutes and we can, um, and we can have a, a sharing around uh, some of this and, um, and Perfect. John was also referring to. So this transition, um, I don't know if the audience has seen versions of this um, before, but it's essentially the fact that we need to go from a very extractive economy to a regenerative economy. We need to move from being extractors of inner and outer resources and ecosystems to being regenerators. And that's, um, that is why we are here. And that's also why you have written um, your great book and why uh, John has offered the world his great thinking. That's because we need urgently to move in this direction. And unfortunately, it's not something that is being talked about enough at, for example, business schools, where many of, of leaders of today has been educated. I, I was um, selected for a Howard Business School uh, two-week um, education a couple of years ago. And the title was Global Leadership Geared for the 21st Century. And I thought I have to be there because that, well, that was more or less the title or the, the subtitle of the book that Giles Hutchins and I have co-authored. But there was no mentioning of what you see on the screen here of the fact that we are in the midst of a sixth mass extinction. We have runaway climate change. We soon have more plastic in our oceans than marine life. I could go on. The people that are in the audience probably know all of this. So we have a very rigid, mechanistic, siloed approach to how we view this challenge that we find ourselves in. We have been um, going through the great acceleration since the 1950s, but what is really missing from the chat when we talk about and refer to the great acceleration is the fact that our mental health and well-being, um, our stress level, depression level, suicide level has been on the same increase as, as the other metrics that are being measured in the, in the great acceleration and referred to in the great acceleration. So we are finding ourselves in a great interconnected crisis. And I find often that when I go to sustainability conferences or especially gatherings that has just been at, in, in Glasgow, I was very involved in the COP process uh, over over 10 years ago. Um, and in those kind of circles, there is a very little focus on the fact that this challenge is interconnected. And for example, when we are incredibly stressed and burned out, it's, uh, it's physiologically impossible for us to think radically outside the box. When we are in a high beta uh, flight or, or uh, or fight brainwave mode, we cannot access, for example, empathy, intuition, compassion. We cannot think outside the box. And, and for me, that is, that is something that is really missing from the discussion when we talk about a transition to a, a more thriving economy. We need to radically think outside the box. But the problem is we're not trained to think outside the box and we are too stressed to think outside the box. So we keep repeating what we know when we feel comfortable with. And what I see also among many regenerative entrepreneurs is that they come from the world of business. So they keep replying, applying a very rigid mechanistic approach to their, uh, to their operation to the value chain assessment, to, um, to how they do organizational design. They keep repeating these rigid mechanistic con control-obsessed ways of managing and leading 
organization. So instead of going all the way and looking at the at their organization as a living, breathing, living system, as John was also referring to, um, many are, are talking about rege regeneration in terms of material use or other metrics, but, but are talking very little about leadership, collaboration, how do we create a self-organized ways of being. So what Jazz Hutchins and I have studied for a few years are those regenerative pioneers that are really also succeeding in building a thriving, abundant culture that is truly regenerative in everything that they do. And, and, and we studied that many of these entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, executives that are leading the regenerative business revolution, revolution is, is, is lending the wisdom of nature and are applying these seven key principles that we refer to as the logic of life. But in many ways, there are so many overlaps with, the, with, this, with John's eight principles. We are referring to the same thing. We are just maybe talking to different target groups. So we created the regenerative business DNA to make it easier for entrepreneurs, intrapreneurs, and executives, and HR managers, et cetera, to get their head around to what extent are we regenerative right now, offer a holistic assessment um, that is covering 17 uh, key DNA strands that if you have them covered, you are very well on your journey towards becoming a regenerative pioneers. So what you saw here is, is, a, is a model where we have leadership dynamic and life dynamic pulsating through the model and the, or the framework. Um, and what we mean by that is that in everything that we do, it's, an, it's incredibly important that we are strongly aware of our own uh, shadows, blind spots, etc. We see so many projections out there in the world of leaders that are not developing a strong inner connection and, and strong self-awareness. And we need that in our executives and leaders of today, our politicians, but we need that in combination with a strong systemic awareness. Do we have that understanding of a of, of a strong sense of interconnected systems and the fact that everything is part of a greater interconnected web of life and what is our role in that and how do we continuously influence that in a, in a regenerative way. So when we have a right balance of that, that is when we are, when we are in our regenerative leadership consciousness, consciousness state of mind. And the second pulsating energy that goes through this model is life dynamics. Uh, this dynamic of, um, of the polarities between divergence and convergence, because what is one of the most essential skills of regenerative leaders is their ability to hold space for emergence and sit with that safe space for creating emergence. So we have the energy of divergence, which is the opening up the experiment and getting many different inputs, maybe organizing a hackathon or a brainstorming session um, where we really kind of experiment and go into a bit of a chaotic energy. But if we never combine that with the energy of, of convergence, where we ground and when we consolidate and when we are bringing things together in cohesiveness, we will be all over the place. So we need in our approach as regenerative leaders to, to have the ability of holding space for emergence and true emergence of new ideas, new, new innovations, new species comes with that ability of holding space um, between polarities and holding space for emergence. So if you're curious about carrying out this DNA assessment, you will go through 17 DNA strands that is covering living systems, design, culture, and being. You ask yourself um, some of these questions that I will give you some examples of, and you map those out and you get an overview at the end as to what extent is our culture um, or our way of beings with each other regenerative right now. It's, an, it's, a, it's a framework that offers a temperature check and the executives and organizations that we work with use it as a way to replace very rigid Q1, Q2 targets and have it as a way of, um, of as I said, taking the temperature. So let me give you a, a few examples of these DNA strands just to make it even more concrete. So the model consists of living systems design, which is all about how do we produce our products and services. Living systems culture, which is all about how do we create the conditions for thrivability as, a, as another regenerative practitioner 
uh, Michelle Holiday use, used as her title for her book. How do we create conditions for abundance, for great connections, relationships, for being in, in what John referred to as right relationship? And then the third component is, is living systems being. What are the qualities that we need to nurture within ourselves and with, within the way that we relate to each other for us to become regenerative pioneers? So let me give you a few examples. For example, let's, let's look at the second DNA principle, which is clever shapes and forms, which is all about how can we tap into the potential of biomimicry. So this is an example of the type of questions that you then ask yourself and, um, and, and, and you go through a point scoring little mini system. So the potential of biomimicry is enormous, all about what can we learn from nature's patterns and forms and principles and functions in how we produce our products and, and services. And if people in the audience have not yet heard of, for example, Janine Benyards, I would really recommend her and her team's remarkable work. They have also been part of creating the asknature.org website where you can tap in any kind of problem and it pops up with nature's ways of organizing similar challenges. Interface is really going all the way and, mm -hmm. and next year they will be ready with their mm -hmm. factories inspired by the principles of a living forest. So how can their factories turn sunlight into energy, purify water, only use regenerative materials, but also improve their entire value chain or the entire interconnectedness of life, for example, by paying Philippine fishermen a fair wage to fish up discarded plastic nets from the ocean um, and, and, and Interface are then using that plastic material in their production. The second component, living systems culture, let's take an example from some of the DNA strands that we cover in that as well. So for example, how can we move in a more self-organized ways of being that, that John was also referring to? How can we move away from this very rigid control obsessed um, mindset that we have had and that I was also trained to apply when I studied business now many years ago? It's that understanding that our organization is a living, breathing, living system, and we need to see what we can do in terms of making that living system thrive. And a living system does not thrive if we put it into very rigid silos that are ultimately competing with each other instead of creating that sense of wholeness. Mm -hmm. So Fritsch of Capra, um, an amazing thinker, visualized it very simply the importance of great, strong, interconnected relationships. So to the left-hand side, we have an image of death, and to the right-hand side, we have an, an image of life. <laughs> And it really boils down to the quality of those interconnected relationships that, that, that determines the thrivability of our living system. So the poorer the relationship, the poorer the wholeness of that system. And that goes for the interconnected relationship in our bodies, in our families, in our school systems, in our organizations, in our societies at large. We need to move away from this a KPI obsessed way of managing performance in our organizations, for example, um, because what if uh, the KPIs of the heart on the mind, those of the spleen, you understand where I'm coming from. We need to, to create that sense of wholeness in how we measure performance in our organizations. We need to think more as super organisms. Um, where we are, are united around the shared purpose. We have very clear communication guidelines. We have very clear understanding of what to do in a certain uh, situation, but then there's a lot of freedom and flexibility in the system. A great case that I'm sure many of you have heard, of, heard about because it's, it's your home turf um, and a case that many are pointing to from all over the world is the amazing case of Wurzog that has really succeeded in creating an abundant superorganism that is, uh, that is freeing the system a lot instead of um, suppressing it with very rigid rules. So I won't go into that case. I assume many have heard about that. And if not, we can take that. So the third component is living systems being, which as you can see on the screen has some of the qualities that we need to nurture within ourselves, within, within our families, within our organizations. And I would just like to mention the last one, which we have decided to call dance. And it's really covering that ability of tapping into the rhythm of life and its playfulness, its creativity. What is needed now more than ever is our ability to tap into our human ingenuity, our creativity, but we are not offered the space or the conditions for us to tap into that. 
Um, so we need to change our perception of that. And we need to honor the fact that we are cyclical beings on a cyclical planet. So how can we as, a, as executives create the conditions for the beings of our organisms, the cells in our organisms to actually thrive? So what we work with when, with many executives and teams is how can we create a cyclical work process flow in our organizations that is honoring all seasons of life. So instead of having executed and been through a, a crazy sprint and then expected to go home and maybe rest for over the weekend and come back on Monday and be in full on spring and summer again. What we work with is integrating all, all seasons into our, into our work processes. So we need, we need the regenerative autumn and winter where we truly make space for integration, reflection, for sharing lessons learned before we are ready for a new sprint. I, for example, make very conscious decisions about making sure that all my weeks, but also all my days have the energy of every season integrated into my work life for me to be truly regenerative instead of uh, in, instead of extracting my own inner resources so so that's an, a mindset that is incredibly important when we talk about regenerative leadership <clears throat> and that ability of embracing polarities in in life that i talked about before as well but it also comes with our um with our comfortableness around or acceptance around the need for a restorative winter in our lives and in our days that we need the the night time to restore and regenerate our resources um, we need the calmness the slowness we need we need the heart we need the compassion um, to enter a greater space in our in our boardrooms and in our decision making forums so this is just a framework that offers a, a starting point on your regenerative leadership journey. And, and although I may have presented this in a, as, a, in, as a very kind of strict framework, it's not at all. It's our attempt to have you started on a journey because this field can, when you, when you start upon your journey in the regenerative field, it can seem a bit overwhelming. And where do I start and where do I begin? And we have met executives and HR, HR prof professionals, eh, entrepreneurs that had that confusion. So the regenerative leadership and business DNA was invented with, with, with an attempt to make it e easier to cross the bridge. But it's important for me to stress that not one size fits all. It's, this is all about having the adaptability and the sense and respond capacity within us as leaders and individuals to assess this, the situation. And also about collectively sharing and learning. Um, I see uh, John as a great colleague. Um, so that's also what this field needs more than, than, than anything that we are co-creating and collaborating. And it's, it's, in that, it's in that weaving together that a new emerging paradigm is slowly but surely revealing itself. And your book is a great contribution to that. So on that note, I wanted to thank you for that um, and stop sharing my, my slides so, um, so we can maybe unfold some of those thoughts and ideas from your book and, um, and in our conversation so far further. Thank you. Thank Th you, Laura. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thanks so much, Laura. I think that if we would consider leadership in a capitalistic society, that it pertains much to control and a mechanistic approach. And I think you just brought leadership very much more alive. Yeah. Um, and into the, illustrating a new paradigm. Uh, so that's beautiful. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, Can I come with a, with a, uh, there's an example that is just burning to get through. Can I just have one minute to share an example? Well, that's the, how a living system works, right? <laughs> <laughs> so something as I emerges. said, I was very involved in the COP process in the, in the early days. Uh -huh. um, and, and there were many things that went wrong, wrong, especially during the COP15 in, in Copenhagen. And an amazing regenerative leader that I admire greatly is Christiana Figueres um, mm -hmm. and how she was holding space for the process leading up to Paris. We've just had Glasgow, which was <clears throat> to some extent a bit of a repetition of Copenhagen. But what she really encompasses and what I witnessed firsthand in, in in closed door meetings, if you can say that, was her ability to hold space, hold space for complexity, for deferring uh, opinions and for, uh, she just had this genius ways of holding a calm, loving, heart-filled space 
And through her way of doing that, she re- achieved outcome that that no one else has, has succeeded achieving before or after her. And I think her and other uh, great pioneers in this field are really leading the way in terms of if we want to succeed with a regenerative economy, it's not about us ticking boxes. It's about us learning to hold space in an entirely yeah. new way where we dare to leap with the heart first. And that was something she said again and again, I'm here to listen from my heart and to speak from my heart. And I want to ensure that everyone is being listened to. And she really applied a right relationship and, and deep listening into her approaches. So I just wanted to mention that because it's a timely example of political regenerative leadership. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you mentioned the word I, I, emergence. I'd like to jump in and really ah. quickly <laughs> add that She's also a woman and expressed yeah. the feminine energy that is often so lacking in, <laughs> in, our, in our economy, in our businesses, in our international relations. There's a, there's a wonderful picture coming out of Glasgow, which is a bunch of largely old white men in suits uh, as the leaders. And, you know, the, the principle is in balance and, and the yin yang in Laura's beautiful slides is, is an expression of that. But uh, you know, as, a, as an old white man, I, I, I need to hasten to say that the imbalance, not imbalance, of masculine and feminine energy, I believe, is absolutely the place to start in, in beginning to think in a more regenerative way. And, and that is not a tick the box, put a woman on the board of directors. That's a very different conversation. Yeah, thanks for Thank that, you. John. Uh, I, I fully agree. And I also want to point out... Um, not going further into this 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 um, item, but I'm I'm noticing um, the change in language when we speak about regenerative economics and leadership. A whole new language emerges um, to define economics. Um, when we did our book launch here, one of the questions was: Do we still need to use the word? Uh, economics, or does that change for you? Because we've been speaking about living systems, for example. And it does it, you don't need to elaborate for a long time, but John, how, how do you feel about that? I, you know, e- economics means the management of the household. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in, in the root, the Greek root of it is, that's what it means. It's the same root, obviously, as ecology. So I don't think there's anything wrong with the word economics. Yeah. The trouble is we've, we've uh, not, not used the word for what it really means, and we need to get back to what it actually means. Laura, any ideas? I think you're pointing towards something really that really excites me and that I've also spent some time on, um, which is the words that we use and our um, level of consciousness around what kind of words we use. Because I, I sense the same as you do, that we are also going through a shift in, in, in the words and the metaphors that we use to talk about transition and transformations. Um, which I think is highly exciting. And what I often lack um, are, the, are the right kind of words. Mm-hmm. And I'm especially challenged. And I don't know if you find the same when you're speaking about this in Dutch. But when I speak about regeneration and regenerative leadership in my mother tongue, well, well it's like there, mm-hmm. there's even fewer words. Um, and I think, I think it's, it is a fantastic or an exciting thought experiment. What if we, what if we co-created or hold space for a new definition of what we now use to describe economics? Is there maybe a new word lurking mm-hmm. in the background that really wants to break through to us? Yeah. That, that's an in, in, exciting thought experiment, but I don't have an answer. Well, let's see what tonight brings. Maybe we'll, we'll come up with something while we go to the guests at our table. Thank you so much, Laura and John, uh, for now. Thank you so much. I think that uh, the leadership that, that Laura has, spoke, uh, has spoken on um, sits at our table. It is. You yes. agree, right? Yes. Yes. And I'd like to start with my guest here on my left side, <laughs> Juliette Schouwers. Hi. Hi. You're the founder of Now School. Yes. And you call yourself a regenerative entrepreneur. True. Um, we're very excited to hear a little bit more about your journey into setting up a first, the first primary 
regenerative school in the Netherlands. Wow, that's a mouthful, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you want to know how it started? Yes, or, please. Yeah. Um, so there are two reasons. The first reason is that uh, is on a very uh, personal, both are very personal, but the first one is that I went through the school sy system like we all did, and I had a very hard time because I felt very connected to nature, but there was no space in school, only outside of school time, right, the playtime. Um, so I really struggled to fit into the box, but I also knew I had to stay true to myself and just be free in a way outside of school time. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was very entrepreneurial already on a young age. So I had many child businesses, as they would call it today, I guess, <laughs> uh, which were mostly about um, community. Uh, you know, I, I gathered all the kids in the street and we created uh, fun games or I created a business together with them. Or it was about nature. So, for example, we had the snails on the street when it was raining and I gathered everyone to bring the snails to our garden so they wouldn't be stepped on by everyone. Which obviously, obviously was not fun for my parents. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the other reason, very personal reason, is uh, I'm, uh, I just turned 34. And obviously, at some point in life, you um, you start thinking about having children. Mm. Uh, and for me, um, yeah, growing up in a world where I see that adults are really, sorry for my language, fucking up things, <laughs> um, I, I really questioned if I should start having uh, children. But on the other hand, I'm very chronically optimistic, and I'm an entrepreneur, so I figured I'm going to start my project. Um, which started at the green school in Bali. So I visit the school, which is a school in, built in the middle of the jungle uh, out of bamboo, and they call this wall as learning because there are no walls. Mm -hmm. And children are actually nurtured to be the change makers they already are. And I felt home when I arrived there, and I made a promise to myself, whatever is going to happen, I'm going to start this school in the Netherlands. And this is where the journey started. So um, and we've how do how do children get nurtured into the change makers that they already are? It's yeah. beautiful. Yeah. Um, so I think children are already connected, but through the education system, we dis disconnect them from themselves, from others, and from planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And uh, by nurturing the connection they already have, uh, you do that through give give them actually the freedom to learn. Yeah. Um, that I think that's the, the most compact way of explaining, because right now we don't have the freedom in the educational system to learn because we're, we're forced to learn stuff. We don't know about why we actually learn them anymore. Um, mm. So giving them the freedom to learn and explore and be curious about what it is that they are um, they are experiencing and what they feel that is true to them, that is actually, I guess, nurturing um, their sole purpose in a way. Yeah. yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. It's also quite fundamental, eh? because well, when you, we work with students, and at the time that they are in our classes, you know, they're so disconnected yeah. that all that economic bullshit makes perfect sense to them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and this is. This is also why I decided to start a school, exactly this point, because if we really fundamentally want to change our whole yep. system to an ecosystem, yeah. it starts in school. The way we learn defines the way we live. So we need a different program without having a new um, dogma mm -hmm. on education. Um, but yeah, it all, the root cause of all our promise problems are starting in education. Yeah. So we say education is the seed of change. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> it's close to our heart, isn't it? It is. Yes. <laughs> this, this, this it's a very topic. hopeful evening. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. How, how, is your, how is this initiative received in society? Um, very positively, overwhelmingly positive. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about the reaction? Yes. Uh, so. We receive love letters every day <laughs> through email to WhatsApp to, I don't know, messages online on LinkedIn because people really see that this is needed uh, and not just one school, but many schools. So we have a huge ambition, but we have to start with one. And um, yeah, it's been it's been received very, very well on, on two levels. On one hand, the parents, because they are looking for alternatives for their child because they, yeah, they don't have the option 
um, that they like for their children. And on the other hand, we have the teachers who are looking for a different way of educating. So um, where we see in the Netherlands right now, we don't have enough educators, you know, there's a big problem. They actually stand in line for now school. So it's not necessarily a, a fact that there are not enough teachers or... What is the underlying um, idea behind that, do you think? The reason why they come to us. Yeah. yeah, why why teachers are so inspired to work with you. I think teachers also don't have the freedom to educate mm. what they think should be educated. So it's, it's again about freedom within the ecosystem. Um, They're crossed by the system. Yes, yeah. Is that your they experience? Are. Yes. I, uh, my, my daughter teaches class at primary schools. Yeah. And um, it's heartbreaking, actually. Yeah. Mm. It's painful. Well, you yeah. get the freedom to do what you want to within the system. Yeah. Because there are very strict rules yeah. which you ha have to adhere to, I think. Yeah, yeah. How yeah. do you do that? Yeah, so we've been on a long journey already. <laughs> <laughs> I started a project three years ago. Right now we have a beautiful team, so we actually have really clear goals on when, when to start and where to start. Um, but we've, we've been questioning ourselves if we should start um, a regular school in the Netherlands, which is paid by the government, or a private school. And uh, there are many reasons to not start a, a funded school by the government, because you are not able to choose your own place. And we are looking for a place which is green and invites kids to go outside and spend time outside with nature, in nature. And on the other hand, um, you have a target in the regular system um, that you're aiming for at least, for example, in Utrecht, 311 children, where we don't want to grow over 176 because of research we did for tribes and you know how they organize themselves. So there were two big reasons not to do that. Uh, so we're going to start as a private school, but with the aim to show a proof of concept to everyone who needs to see. And hopefully, eventually, we, we can become a uh, very inclusive school. But that will take time. So yeah. Mm -hmm. So we need to pave the way to change. And that takes time. And hopefully, that goes fast. <laughs> well, you're working on it anyway. We're working on it, yes. <laughs> John, John has a question, about, well, has, has input about this. In, 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 in indigenous education, I'm sorry, I'm tripping over my words <laughs> here, students are asked to define their own question to then explore Beautiful. Yeah. What, what do yeah, you I mean, feel I, about that? I, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but I was I was on a panel once with an indigenous elder, and he described the education system in uh, in their community, and it, it was exactly what you just described, which is that each human being is a unique genius, and you want to allow each of us to figure that out and tap into that and be that from a very young age. So I I. I uh, Yet, yet again, indigenous wisdom is what we need to re Embrace. re remem remember. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, and 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 to take that approach into account in setting up our educational system. Yeah, and that will reflect eventually to economics, to our health uh, care system, to food, to uh, products, to services. It will apply on everything if we change the way how we educate, not necessarily what we educate. Uh -huh. So asking the right, right questions is key to that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Important. If I can just add a, another kind of generalization is that the, the education system in the West, at least, since the advent of the modern age has been considered as, you know, it's a, it's a machine to educate the, the, the tools of the machine age. And, and we get plugged into buckets and you're told you're a nurse and you're told you're a doctor and, and, and it's completely in contrast with the, the whole idea of the genius of life. Um, so, so you're right, it's the root causes of the economic system debacle is, is really very much in, in how we teach the premise, the assumptions about yeah. the way we think about economics. Yeah, uh, right in line with that, there's a very interesting question about, uh, from David, who's in our audience here. He's asking, how should we implement all these initiatives in higher education? or other education, um, like Thrive, our book, The Donut, um, mm -hmm. Economy Studies, and, in, and its educational environment. So right, the environment around the educational institutions, 
you probably mean right, David. I don't know where you are, but <laughs> <laughs> hi. <laughs> Yeah. 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 Thank you for your question. So, Case, could you firstly respond? Uh, yes. Uh, I think there are two things really, uh, or three things really important. First of all, it has to be uh, pluralistic to the max. And so we have to um, offer, invite uh, students. Uh, as much different approaches as possible, also conflicting approaches. The second thing we, we need to do is to make sure that they um, relate to, to these different uh, approaches. So uh, they, 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 have, they have to find something in the different approaches so that it, it can't be really... Um, Confronting, it can be really um, affirming, but as long as there is uh, a strong connection to it, and then last but certainly not least, we 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 have to start with applying it to real world uh, situations. Yeah, so one of the big problems of uh, economics is that it's very theoretical. Yeah, so it's based upon on models and on figures and on laws. Um, and uh, the problem with models and figures and laws is uh, that it, they never quite work in real life, or they always work different in real life. Uh, and rather than learning the models and then look how to apply them to real world, I think we have to turn it around and start with the real world and then see how we can turn that into economics. <laughs> I think that's the roadmap in it short. Might, it might just emerge from that. From yes. This approach, yes. right? Yes. So looking at the time. Yeah, we need. To, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we should need more time. Yeah, we take yeah. <laughs> to the, back to and the we entrepreneur. We need more time yeah. anyway. Yes, back to the entrepreneur. Well, th th this is this is your entrepreneurship, yeah. mm -hmm. but we have some other entrepreneurs at the table as well. So I'd like to move on to. You've already heard, ladies and gentlemen, Maurits Groen, uh, founder of Waka Waka and of Kipster, and then we also have at the table Anne van Leeuwen. Uh, founder, co-founder of Bodemzicht. I don't know how to translate that in English. <laughs> yeah, the, the great thing is that Google translates it as a bottom few. Yes. But that's <laughs> <a> few. <laughs> and why not? Is that that's not how we meant it. It was more meant uh, soil perspective. Soil perspective. Soil perspective. Oh, nice. Yeah. Well, <laughs> on that yeah. note, soil perspective, could you tell us a little bit more about how you regeneratively farm? Yes, so um, I started a regenerative farm and learning place with my partner, a Spanish biologist, um, uh, around Nijmegen. And uh, how do we farm? Well, the whole point of our farm is to continuously increase the life-holding capacity of that specific place. So to facilitate life, in three words. And uh, actually, the most beautiful byproduct of that whole process is that we have fantastic food and a wonderful community that comes out of it. So life is absolutely central, and the, it's actually yeah, it's managing a whole ecosystem, you can say, and seeing yourself as part of that ecosystem. So it's all about interrelationships. And how do we do that in practice? Well, of course, um, you should all come to the farm to see it and experience it and not look at this PowerPoint. But um, <laughs> in general, uh, for example, we have a no-dig market garden. You see actually an image of the garden, uh, which means that we, um, yeah, we acknowledge that fungi are far better farmers than human beings. And the only thing we need to do is to make sure that these fungi thrive so they take care of the plants and so that we also have a higher production in the process and thus that is good for our economy. So it's all about the interconnection of social, economic and ecological win-win-win situations and creating that, um, strengthening those interrelations in the process. And the outcome is that you have uh, a lot of food, very nutritious food, and food that just tastes very good, which is not unimportant. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the other part of the farm that we have is like we are regenerating this five hectare field that was, um, yeah, 
quite seriously degraded by conventional agriculture. So we had a lot of exposed and eroded soil. Uh, here you see an image of our three chicken mobiles going around. So what we do is we graze holistically. <laughs> that may, might sound a bit fake, but um, it's all about that you, you seriously look at uh, how you can mimic the natural grazing a process of large herds and that you actually think from the plants and from the microbes and from the soil and in that way um, you sort of optimize those interrelationships and you it just gives a lot of energy uh, because it also means that you invite a lot of biodiversity to your farm and we see new species arriving every day and that's why we do it so um, yeah basically that's it um, Perhaps I should say we, we sell directly. So uh, we sell directly to our community uh, in Nijmegen. So we sell to private customers, uh, fetch boxes, but also to restaurants. I love working with chefs because they also challenge you. And uh, it also ensures that there's no, um, it's an outcome based kind of agriculture. It's, it's not a prescription of how you should farm because every place is different. And I think that's also the regenerative part. It's really about reconnecting and place based. I think it's also very good that this indigenous uh, perspective was mentioned because I think that's sort of the core of it that we're really trying in this uh, regenerative movement to reconnect again with place, which is very difficult if you grow up in this Western modern paradigm. Mm. And um, for me, somebody like Robin Wall Kimmerer is amazing uh, mm. in that. She wrote this book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which I can advise uh, you all to read. And uh, she summarizes it in that all flourishing is mutual. And that's actually what I'm experiencing every day uh, mm. at the farm. And um, yeah, that's uh, what we do. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you mentioned place space. I just wanted to, sh to ask you, um, how did that work for you? How, how, how did you do that? A lot of our questions are about how do we implement these theoretical frameworks, perspectives, ideas, etc. This is a, one of those concepts, an economy being place-based or your entrepreneurship being place-based. So how did you go about that? Um, yeah, how does it, it just sort of happens when you farm. <laughs> so that's also, and I didn't, at first, this was also interesting because I thought I could find that suffocating, like to be so much in one place, but I find it enormously, f like it frees me, like, like I could, I never have experienced so much biodiversity and, and, and just diversity in one place. You learn to read a place in, in yeah, such a rich connect. way because you are there all yeah. the time. And it intrigues me, and I find it uh, amazing that I discover that now, and that I've, ne I've never learned that, because you're sort of trained to sort of job hop, and that's supposed to be a career, or to sort of, yeah, be this uh, human being that you can shift around, then um, somehow value is created in an abstract uh, chain. Um, and I, yeah, I... Yeah, it's also because of my partner is, uh, it's all started because my partner is in love with frogs, but <laughs> that's another chapter. <laughs> I hope you do too. <laughs> so that's the house. Go where the frogs, frogs go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, frogs are amazing. That's another uh, story. But um, no, and that's also why I fell, of course, in love with my partner. Here he is, uh, because he's very good at reading landscapes and uh, reading what is actually going on. Yeah. I think it sounds like a fairy tale well to be said here. Yes. Yeah, it, it's, it's sometimes a modern, modern fairy tale. Yeah. It's a modern fairy tale. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, let's leave the modern. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a fairy tale, um, and it's a bloody hard work as well. Eh? But uh, yeah, it's it's um, it's it's an amazing thing to experience actually how fast ecosystems can recover if you sort of touch the right notes. Yeah. And uh, how this is all about. Um, yeah making the space so that the potential of that place can fully express itself, actually. Wonderful, that's a beautiful definition. Will that find its way into your curriculum yes. at school? Yes, yeah, I think there's one thing that just came up into my head because the whole point of an economic is that we, yes, we can thrive, but we can also experience wealth. And I think what you just described is a new way of being wealthy, you know, being on the land, getting very, well-grown food which is tasteful and which is healthy and being there and, and breathing the fresh air, I think this is an amazing example of feeling wealthy 
Um, so yeah, I think you are the yeah. new rich. <laughs> yes, it's fulfilling. I yes. think that might be the word for yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's extremely fulfilling. Yeah. 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 So how does that feel, uh, Maurits, as a man of a certain age, <laughs> <laughs> to see this a new generation? <laughs> Well, I'm, uh, I'm almost at age as well. Regenerating. So <laughs> what is the real question here? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. I'm I really, just, I, I, I really am, am, I admire what I hear. Yes. I'm, I'm really uh, inspired by I what I hear. I saw it in your eyes, so that's why yeah. I... Uh, yeah. hmm. He has a twinkle in his eyes yes. already all night. <laughs> yes. yeah. I saw that. Both your stories, actually. Well, please elaborate, Maus. Well, everything starts with education mm -hmm. by parents and by schools. And, of course, we can learn so much from nature. I mean, actually, we are, as humans, we are so stupid that we don't, do not know a thing about how we should function. We are like Icarus, that thinks he can fly to the moon, but forgets about the laws of nature and falls, uh, falls to his death. I mean, we are in love with our own ingenuity, yeah. and we just start to realize we are only beginning to understand how nature works. Like you said, the fungi. Mm -hmm. They're the best farmers in the world. And what I try to do in the companies that I have set up is I'm really radical in my thinking, but very pragmatic in my actual daily work because we have to make the transition with about 7 billion people in a very short time scale um, in a way that's unprecedented. So I'm, I also am a farmer. Uh, I have one, about 100,000 chicken mm -hmm. spread around four farms. But um, what we do is not like what you do, mm. which is ideal. But uh, for a city like Amsterdam with about a million inhabitants, you cannot have roam around some 200,000 chicken through the city. So what chicken do, they roam around themselves and collect their own food. We cannot have that for the whole, whole of society in a condensed um, city-like country like the Netherlands. So we collect the food for them from so-called waste streams, and we upgrade them to perfect food for the top, um, top um, thing that they do is to laying 200, two, 330 eggs a year, which is top sport for, for chicken. So um, we, we organize nature in, in a certain way for them, uh, listening to what their needs are. I mean, they are animals. And the first thing on top of the, our minds as, as chicken farmers, which I also am, uh, surprisingly as a political scientist, <laughs> is that we look at the nature of the animals. What are the, what's the nature of the animals? They like to roam around, they lo like to be social with each other, they like fresh air, they don't like rain, they like protection, they like a sand bath, everything like that. And then we build a farm around all those needs and then try to um, make it such that we can still have an economy around this new farm. And well, so to my own surprise, we succeed in that by organizing a kind of ecology around the farm with a big retailer that was willing to partner with us. Mm -hmm. So normally you have a, a big retailer that tries to get your products as a, at the lowest possible price, at the best possible conditions for him, most probably him. Mm -hmm. um, and they don't want to partner with you. So as a farmer, you are squeezed between big retail on the one side yeah. and f and banks on the other side. Yeah. And that makes farmers in a position that f coerces them, that forces them in a position that they have to go cost down, cost down, cost down. And that at some point, and that's what we see, it is detrimental to the animals, animal welfare, is detrimental to nature, detrimental to the environment, and also in, in the end to the customers because yeah. we are living organisms within this planet, and we hurt it. We cut down the Amazon rainforest to grow soybeans, to ship them with dirty ships around the, across the ocean, to feed them. We have in the Netherlands 100 million chicken, 17 million people, so we, we import our problems. 
after having caused the destruction of the Amazon rainforest, which will be gone in a few, few decades, and there will be no more food for our animals. Yeah. So that's a, the dead-end system yeah. that we are in. So we completely redefined the whole system and tried to be as pragmatic as to marry big retail, willing to partner with us. So we completely redefined the system. Hack the system. There you go. <laughs> Hacking the system. I, I, I'm triggered by what you said about we organize um, an ecological, the ecological conditions for this to happen. So for yeah. the eggs to, to be produced. Yeah. That, that seems like it's uh, in contrast to the nature of living, the organic way nature evolves. So how do you make, well, as an entrepreneur, the most, well, the, the, the wisest decisions? Mm -hmm. So what is wisdom when you artificially organize these conditions? Well, f first you have to start, like I said, we organize organisms, like chicken, to function for us. Yeah. We take their eggs, that's their yeah. potential offspring. And then in the end, after they don't lay any eggs anymore, we kill them and we eat them. Yeah. That's quite a brutal system. Yeah. Well, if you put so it like that. If we do that, I mean, it's happening in nature as well because animals eat each other as well. Yeah. Then we should organize as organisms ourselves that can think about uh, the other, the, the, the well-being of other animals. Yeah. Uh, the system around the needs, like I started saying, around the needs of the animal that we take advantage of. That's the first thing. And then you try to organize a system which is still also profitable for us to feed ourselves. Mm -hmm. But it, it requires a complete redefinition of the whole system. And like I said, it requires also uh, cooperation in the whole value chain. Mm -hmm. Whereas uh, in the, e the old economy, mm -hmm. uh, we are competitors. Yeah. We try to take as much from the other and from nature and from elsewhere as we can and from the future as we can. Mm. That's not sustainable. So we should r go back and try to redefine what's beneficial for us on the sh in the short term, but also for our environment, living and non-living, but also for the future. Mm -hmm. And then try to organize something which is something that we can live from. Yep. So redefine the old economy. Yep. We had a discussion yep. on should we abolish the term economy? Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's the struggle for uh, the definition of the terms that we use. Mm -hmm. Because um, econ economy, the term economy, has been uh, seized, has been hijacked by the neoliberal economy. That's what we call normal. It's not normal. Is it's a, a power game that they won mm -hmm. over the last decades. We should reclaim that because e economy, like you said, it's it's a Greek a Greek word, and it means our household. Yeah. Ecology is, is also a Greek word. Yeah. It means the logic about the oikos, the, our home. Yeah. So we should reclaim the true value of those terms. I yeah. think. Yeah. yeah, but we, we are also really in need for new words. So when I heard you say value chain, uh, I really love this um, paper by Ethan Solovyev, who who's written a lot about uh, regenerative thinking. And he said we should move from there towards um, web of producers. So mm. like these kind of shifts, so get away from the linear mechanistic thinking because yeah. it's all the time in our language. Mm. Um, we need a lot of rebranding. We need a lot of new words. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Web of producers. Well, it's a new, it's a new business modeling, to, or, I think. Or go yeah. back to the old words, but redefine them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they have been seized, they have been hijacked. We should reclaim them. Because it's a perfect term. No, economy, I agree. We can, we can move on with it. But uh, value chain, I doubt it. <laughs> yeah. I have to rethink about that. <laughs> but you well. understand what I mean. I believe he's accepting your invitation yeah. to, uh, <laughs> to reframe <Try>. this. <laughs> well, this is an important item on the agenda, I think, in, 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 in um, reinventing business models. Um, Laura, what do, you, what do you say? 
Oh, you should unmute yourself. To what, whether we need a new term for a value chain or? Well, isn't there leadership in um, how reinventing our business models in such a way that we indeed also are reinventing the concepts that we work with and Definitely. the names that we give them? Yeah. Definitely. And, and it is a, a process we're living through right now of, of emergence and, and, and figuring out what terms are then fitting. Um, and what do we mean when we talk about a value chain, for example? Uh, a value chain analysis in the, in the old school sense has been very linear. Um, so that would have to be redefined. Um, I can give a few examples from oh, please the do. now school perspective, <laughs> because we were struggling with defined words as well. And uh, one of the things that, for example, we call ourselves is a co-learning space because we believe it's not just a school where you drop your kid in the morning and you take off, but you actually, it's the whole commu community that's learning. Mm. So it's not just the children, but it's also the parents who have conditioning uh, that are put on these children, but also the teachers and the entrepreneurs and the specialists. So everybody within the ecosystem learns at now school. Um, so we, we, we call ourselves a learning community in a living curriculum because our curriculum is always changing and adapting in that living system. So we're trying to combine words or take words from other fields and apply nice. them on mm. now school. Yeah. And that gives it a different meaning as well. Yeah. And, and also to make it as active, as specific as it is. So mm -hmm. I also prefer not to talk too much about regenerative agriculture because it sounds pretty abstract, but I prefer to talk about farming. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it makes it place-based and specific. Yeah, true. Yeah. Actually, you should talk about farming and about education. Learning. Like I, sometimes yeah. I'm, I'm being called a sustainable entrepreneur. I think that's a pleonasm. <laughs> it's uh, wet water. Yeah. <laughs> it's about uh, you, s you, you wake up in the morning and say, should I, um, should I start breathing today? I mean, <laughs> what's the concept? <laughs> So yeah, we yeah, should it's, reclaim it's those terms. Yeah. Yeah. They've been hijacked yeah. from yeah. us. Yeah. 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 So regenerate those terms. Yeah. <laughs> Great. On that note. Yeah, that's a lovely one. We went over our time uh, a little bit. Yeah. And we're Sorry very folks. happy for, for Paris Weiger to uh, <laughs> entertain that request. Well, we're happy to uh, to continue with our audience here at Paris um, uh but we have to say goodbye to the audience at home. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, this was edition number one, yep. yes, of uh, a, a, a three edition uh, program. Uh, next on is um, Degrowth. Degrowth. Yes, yes, in two weeks, I believe. Which, what does it say? Two weeks, yes. Yes. Yep. So <laughs> please Slightly join controversial. us. Yeah, slightly controversial, slightly but we like that. Yep. that. That's the idea. Um, we would be very happy to welcome you there. Thank you so much for all the people watching us online. Bye-bye.